Welcome to C2G Talk, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with practitioners and thought leaders to explore the governance challenges raised by emerging approaches to alter the climate. I'm Mark Turner with Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, and I'm speaking today with Elliot Pepper, an author of speculative fiction whose most recent book, Veil, explores the struggle between different interest groups for control over a clandestine solar geoengineering program. His background includes research on international environmental treaties and building tech startups. And today, when not writing fiction, he provides advice to corporate and government leaders on how to think differently about the future and to create change. Elliot, welcome to CTG Talk. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, let's dive straight into it. What drove you to write a novel about solar geoengineering or stratospheric aerosol injection? And how did you go about researching the issues it explores? So normally when I write a novel, it's hard to pin down that spark, that moment of, of inspiration when, when, the, when I first had the idea for the story. Um, usually it's, it's a bit blurry and, and the story sort of comes in over time and I might have an idea for a character or a theme and then play that out and the book takes shape. But with Veil, vale, I can actually point to a very, very specific moment um, mm -hmm. when, um, when I realized I needed to write this book. I was listening to a podcast um, okay. It was uh, Tyler Cohen's, Cohen's podcast, and he was interviewing Charles C. Mann, um, who uh, actually was being interviewed about a wonderful book that I highly recommend um, called The Wizard and the Prophet. Oh, I know. It's um, fantastic. Yeah, it's just, it's it really, uh, reading it changed the way I, I look at the world today. Um, but I hadn't read it when I was listening to the podcast. And um, uh, during their conversation, Charles started describing current research into solar geoengineering. Um, and I had never heard of it before. Um, and it was so fascinating. And when he, he started talking about some of the trade-offs of you know, what it means to, to actually engineer the global climate intentionally, um, whether or not we've been doing it unintentionally so far in other ways, right. um, uh, I just realized, oh my God, this, this has to be a novel. There, there are so many different angles on this kind of a, a problem. It raises so many questions that impact every area of our lives. So I was sitting there listening to this podcast, realizing I'm going to write a book um, just uh -huh. solely based on that conversation. And that that was really the beginning of a rabbit hole for me. So um, I immediately read Charles's book. And um, as any uh, heavy readers uh, who, are, who are listening or watching this today um, probably know, um, often when you reach the end of a book, authors talk about the other books they read that, that helped inform it. And so I just kept following that line. And you know that led me to Oliver Morton's wonderful book, The Planet Remade, and on, onward from there. So I began reading all the sort of scientific papers on the subject, interviewing different experts on the subject to try to wrap my head around it and figure out where the material, where, where the story was in the material. Um, and that, that's how I got into it. And that was sort of the Vale's origin story. As so tell me about the challenges uh, that captured your particular attention? What, what was it about solar geoengineering uh, that really gave you some, a sense that this has to be dealt with, this has to be talked about? Sure, so um, the, there were a few. So um, one is very straightforward. It's that uh, at least the, the kind of, of solar geoengineering that is described that is in the novel, um, uh, it has, when you make decisions about how you're going to try to engineer the global climate, it's a global decision, right? So it, you know, if you're, I live in California, you know, my, our state government can't start doing solar geoengineering solely for the purposes of residents of our state without then impacting everyone else on earth, right? right. So the, simply the bifurcation between the, the way that such a technology would need to be used and how we as humans on this planet make decisions together, it, 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 they don't line up easily, right? So that was an obvious one. There was obviously a political angle to the story of who gets to decide. If you set this up, who gets to decide how to use it, right? So that was really key. A, a second element that I found really fascinating and wanted to explore was the more I read about um, uh, research into the possibility of doing any kind of engineering, including or geoengineering, including solar geoengineering, um, the more I started to 
real the, the more I started to look at history and the world today differently. Mm -hmm. So as an example, um, you know, uh, the, the book describes people trying to engineer the planet on purpose. But right. if you look at the history of cars, right? I mean, like we discovered oil, we started using it in cars. And at the time it was seen as this amazing thing because most human dense human settlements, every city was drowning in horse manure, right? Nobody could figure out how to make a city denser. So it was this miraculous um, technological innovation that allowed us to live, to live in urban areas in a way, much more wonderful way. And then over the course of a few decades, um, we unintentionally uh, engineered the global climate, right? And so suddenly I started looking at the world differently, that there are actually ways in which humans have been geoengineering for centuries. Uh, when it comes to agriculture, there are many examples. When it comes to uh, you know, obviously the energy system, there are tons of examples there. And we might not have been doing it on purpose, but we have been doing it. And so that really um, shifted how I understood the world we live in right now as I was writing a book about the near future. Well, let, let me pick up that issue of how, how, who decides and how do you decide. I mean, in, in the book, you paint a picture of um, a rogue program, sort of started in secret, captured by vested interests, and, and then you know, a bit of a battle over that. But it ends on a more positive note, um, you know, with international governance and so forth. Do you think a secret program would actually be possible in practice, or is this more of a dramatic uh, tool? And to, to what extent do you reckon international governance systems could anticipate, overcome uh, these challenges through a more open, inclusive process? <laughs> yeah, that's a big sticky question. Um, I, I'd say that uh, I definitely um, uh, use some dramatic license in making sure that uh, the, the, folk, the, the folks who are in charge of the clandestine program in the novel have the ability to keep it secret. Right. So they're sort of, you know, I gave them a bunch of tools to, to make that more plausible than it otherwise might be. Um, I would say that, um, you know, one thing that I, I'm sure that probably many of our listeners are familiar with solar geoengineering much more so than many of my readers are. And so one thing that um, that I think is different about solar geoengineering versus certain other uh, kinds of uh, uh, tech sort of technological scenarios you could play out in the James Bond movie in your head or whatever of what a villain right. could do um, is that uh, you know standing up a solar geoengineering program at least in theory is is really cheap compared to any of these other sort of scenarios you could you could imagine and so that opens the field a lot so when I was speaking to, when I was interviewing folks about, oh, what would, how would this need to work if it was going to be secret? Or, you know, what are the other ways that could go wrong? I mean, it, it's very clear that like any government on earth could decide to try this. Their ability to keep it secret would be, uh, would vary by government. <laughs> um, uh, but also that because it's cheap it, and more accessible, it means that you're going to have more heterogeneous uh, groups that might try it, right? So um, whether whether or not it's secret, I think it could be very, very messy. Um, and right. ultimately, if it's messy or secret, um, you're going to wind up in a situation where you're now, rather than deciding together how to do this right, you wind up in a situation where you're deciding together how to deal with the fact that someone has already started doing it. And the dynamics are quite different. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was something I gave a, lot, gave a lot of thought to. So obviously one of the challenges of governance and a more open or inclusive kind of way of taking these decisions is that people come from different places, live in different contexts, different countries might have different interests in, in, in different outcomes and so on. Do you think it is possible for the world to have a conversation come to some shared understanding and a sort of a just and fair approach to this? So um, my take is that it is possible, but I think it'll take way more time than we normally think. So, uh, and, and so let me take that a step further. So um, we are, 
we've only recently had, like as a, as a culture, we've only recently had the tools necessary to even like communicate quickly across distance, right? Um, we've, only, we only, we've only recently had the internet. We've only recently had all of these different things. And, uh, and, and so I think we're still trying to get used to it. I think that like if you, it, you could take a whole batch of headlines from the past 10 years and put it into the category of humanity trying to figure out like how to be in close contact with each other, <laughs> right? Um, and, and I think that uh, just like kindergartners um, need to learn to uh, share and to uh, clean the classroom together after school, right? And, and, and like not steal each other's snacks. Like, I, I actually think that there's like a pretty strong parallel to geopolitics um, that you have nations that are trying to learn those lessons too. Now, uh, the conflict and collaboration between nations is not new. Obviously that's been going on since we invented nations. But the thing that is new is that a lot of people within those nations now communicate with each other a lot more directly. Like, I mean, even uh, if you think about a simple example like Netflix, like Squid Game as a Korean show that like takes over the global charts, like that would never have happened 15 years ago. Suddenly we're, we're ha like the US, like, I live in California and both by virtue of the tech industry here and also the entertainment industry in California, there's been this sort of vast global reach of like this strange weird state on the West coast of the United States into global culture. But now that's becoming now we're getting more of that going in many different directions at once. I think that um, if you take the long view, um, that I'll, th we're actually all the collectively building a more global culture of which we are all a part. And I think that it the that the more that we're able to do that, the more that we're building shared context for which to make governance decisions together more easily. So I think that if we're saying what will happen next year um, if we discover that someone has been running a clandestine geoengineering program, I'm worried. Um, but that uh, over the long view, and whenever you're talking about climate change, you better make sure to take the long view. I'm much more optimistic. Let's imagine that there is some system of governance that's put in place. I'm interested in your opinion about public trust in, in, in those systems. You know, obviously over the period of the pandemic, we've seen you know, a lot of uh, governance systems work out approaches to deal with it. And yet, in certain contexts, uh, there's, you know, a large number of the public who don't trust this is really being done uh, improperly and suspect secret forces at play, even if they aren't. And similarly, one might imagine that even in a well, you know, governed uh, geoengineering situation, there would still be people who suspect that, you know, things are, are not as they, they say. How do you see dealing with the issue of public trust in governance these days. And I'm actually wondering whether, to what extent books like Vell help reinforce a conspiracy narrative or you know, can they address them? Ah, okay. Let me, um, let me take the, those two questions in reverse order. Okay. So um, first of all, uh, you know, could a story like Vail or any other thriller, right, that, that, that has a conspiracy in it, does that reinforce conspiracy narratives? Um, I think it absolutely does for people who believe in conspiracy narratives, right? I mean, a hundred percent. Like you, you, uh, it's confirmation bias. <laughs> so uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great way to uh, reinforce the fact that you think this is how the world works. Um, uh, but I think that if you zoom out from those people, from that subset, um, uh, what does what do speculative fiction, science fiction, these stories that imagine possible futures, what do they do for us as, as a culture? Um, and uh, uh, Stephen Johnson, um, the journalist has this, he popularized this, what's not his idea, but the, this wonderful idea of the adjacent possible, right? Mm -hmm. that, um, that if you imagine in Earth's primordial soup where you only just had a bunch of uh, 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 molecule, you know, atoms bouncing around, forming molecules, and then those molecules form more complex molecules. And over time, you've got these recombinations that form the first life, right? And then that the recombinations of life itself form the, you know, multicellular life and, and onward and onward. That um, at any point 
in time, at any point in human history, there are tools at our disposal in the, in the world we are born into, and that those tools open up a possibility space of what you can do with them to, to build the next tool or do the next thing, right? And then that changes the world your children or grandchildren are born into. But that that space, while vast, is limited. You're limited by the scope of what you're able to do with the tools. Like if I was born 2000 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to write novels on a computer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no electricity, that's obvious. And so um, in, in my point of view, speculative fiction is sort of this possibility engine. It's a way of exploring the adjacent possible, of thinking, hey, what would the world be like if, right? Um, and that that actually can challenge us to think differently. So if I wrote a story about a clandestine conspiracy laden geoengineering program, could that inspire some people who want to believe it? Sure, but it's also a warning for people who, who are, might be concerned about it or, or it's, it's a spark for people who have never thought about this, right? Um, I remember talking to uh, one of the, the most famous paleontologists in the world today. He discovered the largest, I think, dinosaur that we currently know of in Southern Argentina. And I remember him saying that uh, the movie Jurassic Park mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously totally not technically plausible, but that it was basically the most important like, wor like work in his field um, because uh, every one of his graduate students went into paleontology because they watched Jurassic Park. Right, so it's it's not that it was technically rigorous that makes it powerful in human culture. It's that it inspired people to go work on that set of problems, right? And so, from my point of view as a novelist, one one of the things that I hope Veil vale does is is spark people's curiosity about these questions. Not because I have answers. I don't. I make up stories for a living. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know any better than anybody else. But if it makes other people take a like look more deeply and pay more attention, to me that's a huge win. You're you're in some good company now. I, I don't know the precise ordering of all the novels, but with, there's also Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry yeah. of the Future, Neil Stevenson has just come out with Termination Shock. Yeah. It's almost a a subgenre of uh, speculative climate fiction now, uh, dealing with geoengineering questions. Do you think there's any common thread between the questions uh, that are being answered, the sense of where we are now in terms of uncertainty about technology and society and uh, the size of the climate problem? What, what, why are we seeing all of these come along at the same time, do you think? Ah, yeah, well, it's, so there are actually many parallels that are both like uh, fun, but insignificant, like for example, if you read Veil, vale, the Ministry for the Future and Termination Shock, I, okay, I'll tell you a little story. So um, uh, I, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, who wrote the Ministry for the Future, um, one of the books you just mentioned, um, I sent an advanced copy of Veil vale to him uh, for a blurb, right? Authors all, you know, ask each other to, to praise their work, right? Um, and so uh, I sent Veil vale to him for, for a blurb and I got an email back. He says, Elliot, like, both of, like, I have a new book coming out six months after Veil, vale, The Ministry for the Future, that also starts with a uh, global heat wave that kills 20 million people and sparks a, you know, this uh, solar geoengineering program. And, uh, and so we wound up going, you know, like, it led to a wonderful correspondence where it was like, oh, wow, like, we're, we're reading the same scientific papers, right? And then each, like, uh, you know, both myself, Neil, and, and Stan, like if you read those books, you can see all the common references, like references to Mount Pinatubo, references to these like these common threads that if you start learning about geoengineering, solar geoengineering, you'll just see them in every paper or mentioned in every article, right? And they're mentioned in the novels for the same reason. So I sort of think of uh, speculative fiction writers as riffing on reality in the way that a jazz musician would riff on a standard. So rather than trying to predict the future, you're actually trying to just recombine the ingredients that are already in the world in a way that challenges how people see the world right now. And so, yeah, I, I, to me, that, that, that's sort of a fun common thread that goes through them. Fiction, by its nature, has to have an element of drama in it. There's certain kind of 
tools he used, like Veil as a thriller, a bit of a family drama. The reality of climate policy might feel a little bit more mundane and incremental. Can How does fiction portray that world and make that world seem attractive and more, uh, yeah. So that's, I mean, th that was one of my biggest creative challenges with Veil was how can we, how can I, take something that could easily uh, affect as a story devolve right into just a bunch of people arguing with each other right um, <laughs> uh, and turn that into something that that has a narrative drive to it and that was yeah that was one of my biggest sort of challenges working on the book I think that there one one thing that might be interesting to folks is when is the difference between stakes and scale so this is something I think about a lot as a storyteller. So if you think of the latest Hollywood blockbuster you've seen, like the Marvel movies, which I, I enjoy, right? Like I, I, they're super fun. I, I, I really enjoy watching them, but they sort of have this trap that the, the, the writers have gotten themselves into, which is, well, okay, like you've saved the world. So now you need to save the solar system and then the galaxy or right? Like, like you have to keep raising the stakes um, because otherwise, somehow it feels like it's not important enough to deserve a Marvel movie, right? Um, and uh, but in but when I'm working on a story, um, the thing that really drives it is not stakes, or, or sorry, it's not scale. It's not um, oh, we're saving the world and then the galaxy. It's stakes. It's what do the characters care so much about, right? Um, like, what do they care about that they will go to the ends of the earth to try to make it work? Um, that's their quest, right? So, like, that could be saving the world, it, but that feels fairly generic. It could also be, you know, popping out to the store to get some milk. I mean, it, if you cared that much about it. Um, and, like, a good pop culture example of this is uh, the show Succession just had its season mm -hmm. finale. And if you think about that show... Um, it's just about a bunch of kids, like basically uh, uh, trying to maneuver around each other over control of a company. But like, who else in the world cares? Nobody. They just really, really care. And that's what drives the drama in the show. So one of the things that I needed to find when I was working on Vale is who are the people, who is the kind of person who would care about resolving a, you know, trying to like resolve at least one problem associated with geoengineering in such a deep personal way that it would change them, right? That, that in, in questing for that kind, you know, for the thing they wanted, it would show them what they really need out of life. And so that's what I try to think about when I'm grappling with something like, how do I turn this into a story? It's what is the who is the person and why do they care so much about this thing so what kind of response did you get with this framing and how you did it from you know some of the environmentalists and climate experts that you'd spoken to how did what was their reaction to 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 what was finally given back oh uh i mean i honestly i've been i've been surprised i've been really delighted i mean they've said nice things maybe they're saying that because they're saying it to me Right, but uh, no, I mean, like the the response from folks in this field has been uh, overwhelmingly positive, which I I was sort of shocked by because you know when you're making a piece of art, you're always worried about uh, you know you want people to like it, right? Um, and so uh, uh, it's been it's been really wonderful and inspiring to see that it resonates with people who have who know far or more more about the subject than I ever. Do you read. think there's a sense in which some of those people who knew more and who guided you know your original research mm -hmm. then got something back in terms of how they felt about the work they were doing how they were emotionally reacting to the work they were doing i hope so um i mean i think that ultimately that's part of what stories can do right um if it uh uh when i when i read a novel that really resonates with me it it helps me look at my own life in a new way it helps me feel more connected to to other people, even if they're totally, you know, they're made up, they're fiction, they're, they're, they're fragments of someone's imagination. Um, but it, you know, 
when you really connect with someone on a human level through fiction, um, it, yeah, it can shift the way you see the world and make you feel more connected. And so I hope that that's the case with Vale. And, and honestly, I, I hope that, um, you know, one of the, one of the wonderful things about uh, a story like this is, okay, early in our conversation, I mentioned um, Oliver Morton's The Planet Remade. And everyone or many people who have started to go down the solar geoengineering rabbit hole, that's a great place to start because right. Oliver does such a tremendous job. I started with it too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so if you're, yeah, if you're, if you're listening now, um, and your this conversation makes you want to learn more. Start there. It's a great place. Um, but uh, the thing with the planet remade is that basically the people who read it have already raised their hand intellectually to say, "I'm interested enough to learn more." Right? Like I like I picked up a book called The Planet Remade. <laughs> like I'm going to find out what this stuff is all about. So the planet remade is perfect for people who are at that point in their lives. Um, but a cool thing about a book like Veil, and not just Veil, like T Termination Shock, like The Ministry for the Future, is that these books actually make a very different promise to the reader. The promise to the reader is, I'm going to take you on a journey, right? I'm going to, I'm going to bring you on an adventure, and it's going to be fun, and it's going to be exciting, and we're going to learn stuff. Um, and hopefully, if, if I've done my job as an author, um, uh, you're going to want to keep reading. You're, you're not going to be able to stop turning the pages. And then when you finish, it's going to stick with you long after you reach the end, right? Like it's a, the ending is going to be surprising, but inevitable, all of those things. And because the promise to the reader is different, you get different readers. So many of my readers have never heard of geoengineering. This is, in fact, probably the interview I've ever done for the novel since it came out, where I actually used the words geoengineering by far the most times because you know who it is and our the audience does right but for the most part my readers this is totally new to them they're right. coming because it's a story and if it makes if it like sparks uh, a little bit of curiosity in just a tiny percentage of them to me that's a uh, that's a beautiful thing. And it's a beautiful thing in part because as we are collectively building this big cult, this big cultural ship, right? Like we, we need those common metaphors to, to make sense of the world. Like if you think of George Orwell's 1984, think about having to have a meaningful discussion about state surveillance without being able to use that as a common metaphor. It'd be really hard, right? Um, so fiction can offer that. And I hope that whether it's uh, Termination Shock or Ministry of the Future or any of these other novels that grapple with how the climate is changing and what we could be doing about it, that, that, that fiction can help give us the tools to, to do it right. On your website, you posted an interview with Stuart Brand, uh, the futurologist, uh whole earth catalog famous uh, icon in this area he, he famously said we are as gods and have to get good at it first of all do you agree but secondly are books like these helping people get to grips with what it would be to be as gods and be good at it <laughs> uh, uh, yeah i don't know if um if, uh, I if, if I can credibly call Veil a, a good how-to guide uh, to, to, to apotheosis. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I do think Stuart is right. I mean, like, it, if, imagine that you could go back in a time machine and, and bring someone from, uh, you know, uh, the Roman Empire to the present, right? I mean, we have towers of glass and steel that go it, like so many stories into the sky, right? Like we've we've used uh, like electrons and sand to make thinking machines that we can have instant communication anywhere on earth with. We, we have these flat panels that we spend all day looking at because we've brought them to life. Like, I, I mean, it's magic. It's, it's like, it's technology and that's magic, right? And what that means is it gives us power it, instead of spending all day foraging, like I spend all day making up stories and 
typing them out <laughs> and, and sending them to people, right? Um, we right now are talking over Zoom, at, you know, from all, uh, totally different sides of the world. And then, you know, you explained to me before we started the interview that not only will this just be distributed globally on the internet, you're going to translate it into many different languages and make it available, right? Like, like all of this is, is incredible, but it also means that the second and third order effects of anything we do are extraordinary. You know, instead of throwing little pebbles into the pond, we're throwing boulders now. And so if you throw a boulder and expect it to create the ripple of a pebble, you're in trouble. And I think that's what Stuart is really getting at. And one of the, you know, one of the really core themes in Vale that the, the hero grapples with is that she, like often we look at the world and we see all of these problems, right? Uh, I mean, read the headlines. It's just a list of these huge problems that feel so big. How do we, how do we find any traction at all with them, right? And I think that the the tension that she tries to uh, to sort of transcend in in herself over the course of this story is that that those problems are inevitable, right? You want to you want to you you bring in cars and you solve the problem of horse manure and allow cities to grow again, um, and then you create the problem of climate change, right? So you like all pr these these problems will keep happening there's no there's no end game right that you're just always going to have more problems and also that these problems are soluble right we did solve the problem of manure in cities we just invented a new one for ourselves and i think that often internally we have this emotional tension where we want the world to just work right? We, we want the solution that doesn't create a new problem. And I think that is, that is what is beyond our grasp. And so instead, what we need to do is look at the world in a clear-eyed way, create the best solutions we possibly can without pretending that they're not going to have consequences that we didn't expect. And, you know, I, I think that's part of what Stuart is getting at. And you've also touched in your answer on the question I was going to close with, it's a lot of us working in this field and generally people, you know, learning and writing about the enormity of the climate crisis, it's huge problems, you know, really, really start to face issues of anxiety, despondency, grief, and this is emerging as a, a serious challenge as to how we, you know, as a, a community help uh, solve this problem, if, if such a thing is possible. Uh, solving is a, an interesting word sometimes, but um, what are the tools? I mean, you spend a lot of time looking into this. It is somewhat bleak sometimes when you sort of follow through the threads. How do you personally find, uh, you know, maintain a sense of agency and hope? And how do you think that that, you know, without underplaying the actual size of the problem and the inevitability of these issues, how do you, uh, you know, do you think wider society can actually tackle uh, and, and main, you know, these sense of grief and maintain a sense of agency and hope. So, um, Vale actually starts with the, the main character losing a parent. And you, what you just said is why. Um, there is this, we have this, this grief for how, how, the, how the world is, is changing in all of these unexpected ways that we don't want. And and at our own appearing inability to do anything about it, right? And I, I think everybody can connect with this, right? Like whenever in your personal life, whether it's like uh, something happens in your family and you want to help that person, right? But, you, but there's nothing you can do. Like, you know that they need to make that change for themselves or whatever it is, right? Like we, like that's a core part of being human. And I think that it's so, it's such a dangerous trap uh, with when it comes to uh, people who are working on problems of the size of the climate crisis, right? Um, it, it's just, it can be overwhelming. Um, and, um, and so uh, the way that I try to handle that, because I, I feel, I mean, I'm using different tools than a climatologist might 
or that a policymaker might, but like, as a storyteller, as a novelist, I am deeply interested in these problems and I'm trying to find a way to contribute, right? Um, uh, and, and, and so I have those same feelings. Um, and the thing that I find helpful personally is, um, is, to, is, is twofold. Um, one, um, whenever I start to feel that despondency, that, that just sort of like blanket grief, um, I, I look for ways to do very, very practical uh, things for, for people in my life. So like that might be a friend, it might be a stranger, it might be like I get an email from, I don't know, an a student who wants to be a writer and they don't even know what question to ask, right? But like, I'll, I'll, I'll actually respond with like a, 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 like I'll spend a lot of time trying to basically do a favor for a stranger, right? And I find that um, because dealing with something like the climate crisis is so big, and in some ways abstract, right? It's something that is happening in our imagination. We're experiencing the effects of it concretely, right? Like I live in California, we are choked by smoke every summer from wildfires, but the solutions are much more abstract. Um, and so uh, finding practical ways to do something to, to, to make someone else smile in my life is actually extremely helpful. And it's even more helpful when I pair it with um, something we already touched on in this conversation, which is that, uh, that we are like, the human lifespan is a totally arbitrary number, right? Like we're, we're not alive for that long. I mean, if you look at the geological time scale, it's like not even a blink of an eye, right? Um, it, I mean, if you look at from a mayfly's perspective, we live forever, um, but, uh, but the, when we're talking about things like the climate crisis, that's a huge scale problem that will be playing out for a long time, regardless of how we are, what we do about it. Um, and so it's really helpful to remember that um, we're all still trying to figure it out, right? Like it may feel like it's been going on forever, but in fact, like if you look at any other big problem that like human civilization has been faced with, uh, we're reacting faster than anyone ever has, right? To basically anything. And we have new tools at our disposal to do so. So I, I think that um, it, I find that to be a source of hope because I'm not worried about the planet. Like I am worried about real people who are living in specific places on the planet and are in terrible situations that this will make worse but I'm not worried about the planet itself over a long time scale. And I have a lot of confidence that as, as our culture starts to process this set of problems, we will invent new ways of solving them. But what that means is that I, if, if I believe that, I can't then come around and blame myself for not having like, it, like invented it yesterday, right? Like that's not how this is gonna work. It's gonna take, like all of us over the course of generations to do this right and to figure out the right path forward. On that note, Elliot Pepper, thank you so much for being a guest on CDD Talk. Thanks so much for having me.